Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи! В эфире программа Ушанка Шоу. Several days ago, I posted this picture on my Ushanka Show community page, and it created a lot of discussion. We have about 524 likes and 55 comments with many questions. So today we're going to talk about this photo and as well as about videos and pirate videos in the Ukraine in the 90s. This picture was taken pretty much 25 years ago and my first thought when I found that picture recently was like, damn, I look young. Quite a few viewers commented about my vest and it was handmade and my mother needed for me and uh, it was very warm and comfortable. Of course, my wife, when she saw that picture, she thought it was extremely ugly, dorky, as she said. Uh, I have a popular Devil's Days uh, haircut called Yozik, the Hedgehog. And my hair has a little bit weird color because out of uh, curiosity, I decided to try some extra color left when my girlfriend was coloring her hair. That's why it has that weird shade of brown. So this picture was taken in the small private store, uh, which was uh, selling and renting videotapes, which you see behind us. It's here I'm uh, next to a friend of mine, Oleg who is actually Russian by nationality. He's one of those families. Uh, he's from the military family, so his father was a Soviet officer and he got assignment in Kyiv. So they moved, got an apartment, and we went to school together and then we kind of became friends. If you follow my channel, you should know that in the middle of 1990s, my life uh, had a huge change. In the summer of 1995, I went to the United States of America for the very first time in my life, and I worked in a summer camp as a photography specialist. And you can read my book about those adventures called American Diaries 1995. After return back to Kiev in the fall of 1995, I finished my college, got my diploma of electrical engineer. But of course, back then there was really no jobs to my speciality, so I just work here and there, and actually I'm talking about those events in my new book that I'm almost done and translating into English, American Diaries 1996, which is basically about my second uh, trip to America, where I work at the same camp, Camp Rosenthal, here in Michigan, and I work at that time as the lifeguard. I returned back to Kiev in the end of September 1996. For the second time they gave me a visa was way shorter than the first time, and I wasn't really planning to work at all because uh, when I went to Michigan, they paid me $110 a week while I worked at the summer camp. And then I worked for cash at the local farm for $5 an hour. I worked every single day of the week, 10, 11 hours. So I was making you know, $50, $55 every day times 30, so close to $1,500 a month. Back in Ukraine, people were getting paid $50 a month or $100 a month. So after my uh, salary income in Michigan, I really like, yeah, I can just hang out and then go back to America again next summer. So that was my plan. So after a month or so, I grew bored. Just, you know, hanging out at home was really not much fun. Uh, so when uh, Oleg, this uh, guy on this picture, uh, offered me a job to work at this uh, video store, so this uh, store was kind of, it was doing uh, developing uh, film and pic uh, printing pictures. Uh, this was one large room, then selling some cosmetics, and then we sold electronics like TVs and VCRs. And then we had this video rent and video sale. And he said, they're looking for a guy who can uh, work uh, like every other week. So there'll be like shifts, you work seven, uh, not seven, seven, I think, or six days a week then you're home for a week and they'll pay you a hundred dollars a month for that. So it sounded like an interesting gig and I agreed. I mean, I didn't really care about money. As I said, I could make it that hundred dollars that they paid me a month. I could make it in two days in Michigan, but I said I was bored and it wasn't really hard work and it was pretty close to my place where I lived. So I agreed. So I worked there pretty much until the summer of 1997 when I went again back to the United States to work in a summer camp. When I found this picture, I wasn't sure if it's the uh, first time I worked there or second time because after returning uh, from the United States in 1997, I worked there again. But because of modern technologies and Google and films in the background, it was easy to determine so it actually was 1997. So that was my first season of working there. 1996 into 1997. 
So if you look at the video titles behind me, you could see The Razor with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Looks like it jingles all the way with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Striptease with Demi Moore. Naughty Professor with Eddie Murphy. We've got Oldie, the ghost, with Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. Jurassic Park. Uh, there's something with Stallone, I believe. So most of those movies, except The Ghost, it's... Uh, 1996 movies like Striptease and Eraser. Uh, interestingly, I found the newest is a Met Metro. It's not on the, with the picture, it's right kind of above my shoulder. It says M E T P O, it's the Russian for Metro. I looked it up. It's a January 1997 release. So this was taken a couple of months later, a month or two later. And because we're both wearing sweaters, so that's, I assume, will be maybe March of 1997. And also you can see behind me the advertisement for Fuji Collar film. So we were uh, having a machines from Fuji film uh, to process film and print on the Fuji paper. So we were kind of like a Fuji distributor. We were selling a uh, Fuji Collar film as well, as well as processing. And uh, there's a separate story that, you know, so people will come to develop film. And back in the day, it was quite pricey. So usually people will just develop film. And then they look at the photos and the negatives and they decide which picture to print. No one would just do it like they did here in America. You just give the film and they print you all the pictures because you can waste a lot of money. So back in the day, you bring the film, we develop, you pay for developing of the film. Then you look through the negatives and then you place the order which pictures you want to print. Fun fact, the guys who are in printing, you know, they were trained professionals because you need to know how to mix chemicals and all that stuff. They kept this little uh, secret album. So anytime there'll be a photo of Pretty Girl, maybe semi-nude or in the bikini or sometimes people want to take a picture of their wife or girlfriend in nude. Uh, so we had a secret album that they printed extra copies and put in there. So sometimes you come to work and people are like, hey, we got some new photos. And you can grab it and you check it out. So we had, it's really naughty when I think about it. But it was uh, fun when I was <laughs> 26 to uh, check it out that album every other day to see. And some girls were gorgeous. Also, I was making a little extra money on the side. Uh, besides Oleg's shoulder, there's a little sign. All you could see says Pere. It's actually the Perevod. So I was uh, translating uh, different documents for people upon request. Most of it was I would provide some basic translations for any VCRs or audio players that we sell. But if po people wanted like detailed translation, then they'll cost them extra money because I was just explaining basic functions at that time. Electronics that came to Ukraine didn't have a translation neither into Russian or Ukrainian. So I was making extra money providing uh, translation services. Okay, so let's talk about videos. Back in those days, so this is we're talking mid-90s, everything was pirated. So all those videotapes, the pirated copies, and there were pretty much two kinds. The pretty ones, they had a nice color jacket, Maybe even was Russian translation, still was a pirated copy, but it was more like premium. That's the one people maybe will buy in their collection if they want it to look nice. I already made a video about earlier periods, so we're talking about like late 80s, and that video is called How Hollywood Finished Off the Soviet Union. I'll post the link in the comment section to that video. So that's when first videos and VCRs came still in the Soviet Union. And if you want to learn even more about how the Hollywood affected, especially post-Soviet era and children that grew up in that time, I strongly recommend book by Leon Kaminsky, The Geek Who Came From The Cold, Surviving the Post-USSR Era on a Hollywood Diet. This book is available on Amazon. You can get paper copy or electronic book. And this whole book is just about movies and life in Moscow. So he grew up in Moscow, Russia, and then later immigrated to Germany with his mom. So I strongly recommend that one. I read that book and it's all about movies. Just 
it's amazing if you're into that stuff, if you like Hollywood culture and see how it's affected uh, people in Russia, I would strongly recommend you to check out that book. Some people already were asking about what, how about the quality of those videotapes? Well, the worst quality was so-called movie theater copies, and that's when a person goes into the movie theaters with camcorder and filming the movie. Those were, of course, the worst quality. First of all, because you could see sometimes people getting up and walking to use the bathroom, or the camera will be, you know, in and out of focus if the operator is not that good, because usually they're just holding the camera kind of hiding by their ear, you know, by on their shoulder. I remember one time I watched um, Home Alone, I believe it was Home Alone 3 maybe. And so that was the movie copy. And the guy who was filming it was chuckling whole movie. So, you know, there'll be some episode and then you can hear him. Ha, 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 ha. And when he chuckled, the camera was shaking. So I found it extremely annoying. So that was like worst case scenario. If you really want to see the movie, you'll watch movie theater version. But otherwise, people tried to purchase so-called good quality. And actually, I remember uh, my friend Alex that also went to America a couple of times to work on exchange program in the summer camps. He mentioned that one time in JFK airport, he was approached by the lady and she politely asked uh, to take a videotape with him and offer him $20, which, you know, huge money for somebody of <laughs> Kiev. And all you need to do is just bring the tape and in Moscow, somebody will meet you and you give them the tape. So he did that, of course, after 9-11, it's unheard of to have such interaction. But that's how he made extra $20, by just uh, grabbing a videotape and uh, giving it to someone in Moscow. And when I work at that video store, I remember a guy bringing a big bag with the tapes. And it pretty much was up to him. He would uh, check what we sold and he will replenish inventory. And one time he was actually asking around if we know anyone who wanted to work for him. And it was a pretty... Nice job, uh, 12 hours uh, in some apartment. They had like 40 or 50 VCRs that constantly were copying movies. And all you have to do is just uh, chill, watch the movie or whatever, and then just keep an eye when the recording stopped. You just swap the tapes and rewind the tape and start all over again. And then you apply the labels or uh, set it aside for somebody else to do it. So that was pretty kind of easy job. Uh, so for someone who wants to watch movies all day, all night, and just swapping tapes, that'll be a good gig. So let's talk about video rent. Well, what's interesting, just about 10 years ago, that kind of business was impossible in the Soviet Union because hardly anyone had VCRs in the late 80s, and they were extremely expensive. I heard stories that, like Panasonic SuperDrive, I think was called the model, which top-of-the-line VCR. People were asking for brand new unit, five, six thousand rubles. My parents, in 20 years of being together in the Soviet Union, managed to save five thousand rubles. So there were stories of people trading in a used uh, Lada car for the VCR, or maybe uh, if their grandparents passed away, they have an empty small apartment, they will trade an apartment for the VCR. That's how they were expensive in the late 80s right before the collapse of Soviet Union. Now we jump in 1996-97, there is a uh, plenty of people who own VCRs, still not like a lot, a lot, but enough to support video rental business. And the way it worked, I mean, pretty much similar to the United States, except uh, you needed always uh, to ask for the document. So we asked for passport as a not a hostage, but we call it Zalog, so to make sure you come back and bring the tapes. So people will bring their passport. That was a requirement, nothing else. Just bring your passport. Then you issue them a couple of uh, videotapes. And, of course, they must to rewind them in order to avoid the fee. And if they didn't bring it next day, then, of course, they'll be... We didn't have, a, like, late fees. You just keep on charging them every day people have the tape. Uh, so that was how that business worked. You bring the passport, you get the tape. And of course, there were people who managed to steal a passport or find a passport somewhere. Then they go to the video store and they try to grab, you know, five videotapes. And it will never come back because it's not their passport. So that was my job to verify 
this is the owner or a kid, you know, brought the pa parents' passport, and then of course you don't give them ten videotapes because there's no way you can watch all ten uh, movies in one day. So that was, but you know, those things happen too. And then you have the stupid passport you don't know what to do with, and you lost the videotape. Any of you, the old timers, that remember the days of the VCRs and videotapes, uh, the longest videotape available was 180 minutes. So it's a three hours, right? I don't think they had 240 minutes. I doubt. At least in 1997. So in order to have a successful video rent business, uh, you usually try to have two movies on one tape. This kind of offers more value for the renters. So that's what we did. We actually made our own uh, videotapes because we were selling VCRs, so we were utilizing them. And remember, there is a VCR, so it's a video recorder. You know, it's not only playing videos, also can record videos. They also were VCPs, so those are players. They didn't have a capacity to record, and they were a little bit cheaper. So we will record our own uh, video rental tapes and sometimes the movies will be way too long uh, to fit in one tape so a guy I worked with so he was actually a older brother of the owner and he had a problem with drinking so that his was job is to fit two movies on one tape and he did a pretty good job he will watch through the movie and then decides you know I need to get rid of 15 minutes so he will go through the movie and cut out some parts that kind of you know don't really need it to be in order to fit the movie as a second movie but sometimes if you come to work drunk he will just do a bad job and then people come back and all pissed because they were in the middle of the show and it's like what happened the main uh, person just disappeared from the show did he get killed or what happened to him or he was just cut off movie at the end and uh, there's like the people were upset so then you have to give them another tape so they can watch uh, what actually happened <laughs> so we had that occur once in a while and once again if you remember those days each videotape had this plastic taps that in order to prevent tape from being messed up like recording over it you will break the taps and that will tap, tape will be not recordable anymore but of course if you cover it with the tape like a scotch tape you can uh, trick the vcr and make it recording again so we had situations i don't remember if it happened in our store some pranksters uh, they rented a, a children's movie collie about the dog and in the middle of it they recorded a short part of a german porn that involved dogs you know there's a christian wholesome porn that doesn't involve animals and then there is a dirty porn so then there was a story that a kid was watching that movie and then started calling his mom 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 look at there's a girls and dog is doing something crazy so of course you can imagine upset parent coming back to the video rental store with the collie tape uh, claiming there's the german porn in the middle of it and speaking of porn uh, yes we did have some uh, usually there was a products from germany or italy and it's kind of silly, but the nickname for porn, we didn't call it porn. There was this kind of a word that everyone knew that somebody's asking for murzilka. Murzilka, that means they're asking for porn. And there will be some guy who comes in like, hey, do you have any murzilkas? And you're like, yeah. So, but it was hidden, of course, not on display. We had maybe 10 tapes. Uh, so, yeah, we had it available. All were imports back in middle of 90s. We didn't still have a domestic industry of uh, porn movies. The weird part of this Murzilka slang, because it actually was a name, official title of the children's magazine. I don't know how that went from children's magazine into the nickname for porn, but it is what it is. Murzilka. Murzilka. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, my salary back then wasn't that great. I mean, comparing with the United States, I was making $50 per week. But I had a nice perk. Uh, the owner of the video store didn't mind if in the evenings I will take a VCR home and some tapes and watch movies at home with friends. Uh, for him, it was a benefit of me knowing the movies. So if the people come and ask for advice, like which movie do you, do you think I should rent? Because of course, back in those days, there was no advertising on TV, you know, no previews of the shows. So the person that in the video rent store he needs to know the movies so i was uh, at night 
if I knew there'll be like rainy day, I'll bring VCR, a couple of my friends show up and we'll watch the movies at home at my place. And one time, and here I must specify, it was done only for the educational purposes. I brought home VCR and Italian porn. So that porn movie was a Red Hood story in the porn version. And somehow translator had it everything rhymed. I'm not sure the original was rhymed because it was in Italian, but it was the whole Red Hood story in the porn version and translation was so hilarious we were laughing our heads off. So that was a bizarre kind of thing. You know, I think it was like three or four dudes watching this Italian Red Hood porn and just watching it like it was a comedy. Okay, and it's kind of nasty part here, but I have to tell you the story. So there was an episode in this movie where three lumberjacks showed up at the Red Hood's uh, mom's house. So they were doing mom. And at one part, of course, she's all covered by um, happy lumberjack guys. And then one dude saw actually leaking that uh, white substance of her body. And he said, oh, it tastes so sweet. And one of my friends said, oh, that's bullshit. It's salty. And we had to stop the video. And we'll look at him like, what did you just say? So he was working really hard to explain how he knows that sperm tastes salty. That was, we were laughing, crying, that was hilarious. So since then, I realized I'm not really a big fan of watching porn. I mean, I didn't mind to see girl on girl action, but uh, seeing naked guys and seeing their schlongs, it just didn't do a thing for me. So that's kind of where my uh, porn education came from, from a bar and VCR and some uh, videotapes at this rental store. Also, while working there, besides uh, making a little bit extra money by translating the different instructions for the VCRs and TVs, I also was making some money uh, doing a troubleshooting at home for people, like this uh, geek type of business that Best Buy has. Uh, so if people will come and they will complain about some troubles, they can figure out how to get VCR working with their TV uh, for the small uh, cash amount I will come over and help them like one time there was a daughter and a mother came they returned to videotapes and I could tell they both tapes just had about five minutes they never uh, you know rewind the tape back they just watched for just a couple of minutes left the way it is and the mom asked me kind of shyly do you have a uh, any uh, videotapes uh, made for Panasonic VCRs so I knew then that they have no idea what they're doing. So their father just purchased VCR and then he, uh, I guess, left uh, for work for a week or so. So they tried to get this VCR going. They didn't get any mess image on TV. Once again, if you remember back in those days, uh, quite often you had this antenna connection between the VCR and your TV. And then your TV needs to find the channel uh, where that VCR, right? So I came to their place and I got it all going. Um, I actually sold them uh, cables to connect directly uh, VCR to the input of TV. And of course, if you have older model of TV, then you have to have use antenna cable. But then if you hook up antenna cable, then you can watch regular TV through antenna. So I sold them uh, additional cables, came to their place, hooked up everything and everything was great. So I just remember that uh, silly question, uh, do you, uh, sell or rent any videotapes made for Panasonic VCR. Okay, my friends, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe learn something new. It definitely brought a lot of memories looking at this picture and answering your questions. And as always, I would like to thank all my supporters on Patreon.com as well as the people that uh, support me on YouTube. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. Потому что если дороги будут, то по ним неприятель проедет и прямо в сердце России попадет. Я с ними согласен абсолютно.